Hello students and welcome to the today's class. Today we are going to discuss a very important aspect related to Mesopotamian civilization and we'll be talking about the religion in the ancient Mesopotamian society. After going through this lecture, you will be able to understand the background of the Mesopotamian religion, know the development and composition of pantheon, enlist the various services and offerings to the gods, and to learn how religion became the base of Mesopotamian civilization. Since the evolution of societies, a religion has been considered as one of the most delicate and vulnerable aspects of human life. Despite the fact that it appears simple, but in reality, religion cannot be easily explained or understood. It has a significant impact on the lives of people, though there are some exceptions also. However, everyone agrees that it exists as a human activity and has grown to be a significant part of human existence. Religion was wavered more theistically in the West due to the influence of the inherited Judeo-Christian tradition. And in the East, it was primarily a response to the sense of uncontrollable natural forces and an underlying desire for an ethical and moral standard. Etymologically, the word religion is derived from the Latin word religier and it means to bind fast. Thus, religion has undoubtedly a great importance on community aspect. It is regarded as something that binds the members of the group firmly together. Studying primitive religion, E.B. Taylor, who is an anthropologist in his book Primitive Culture, gives a short definition of the word religion, wherein he understands religion as the belief in spiritual beings. However, it is very difficult to understand religion by any definition, as none of the definitions are complete and comprehensive. The term religion is not an exclusive term, rather it's an inclusive, which includes many fold elements and aspects of life, like beliefs, feelings, experiences, values, symbols, worship, rituals, festivals, cult and culture, and myth and mythology, etc. The religious beliefs and practices of the Sumerians and Akkadians and their successors who were Babylonians and Assyrians form a single stream of tradition. The Sumerian in origin, Mesopotamian religion was added to and subtly modified by the Akkadians whose own beliefs were in large measure assimilated to and integrated with those of their new environment. Religion inevitably shaped every aspect of ancient Mesopotamian culture, as it was the only intellectual framework capable of delivering a detailed explanation of the forces that control humans to live in consonance with morality. The religion produced the structures through which that civilization's social, economic, legal, political, and military institutions are to be understood. It is pertinent to mention that Mesopotamian religion in many ways influenced people of different regions and cultures even outside Mesopotamia, such as the Elamites to the east, the Hurrians and the Hittites in the north, and the Arameans and Israelites to the west. There were different stages of religious development in ancient Mesopotamian society. The migration of numerous people into Mesopotamia had little or no impact at all on the religious development and in fact, the cultural development of Mesopotamia. Rather, it forms a uniform, consistent and coherent Mesopotamian tradition, changing in response to its specific internal necessities of insights and expression. It is possible to distinguish a basic substratum involving worship of the forces of nature, often visualized in non-human forms. It specifically includes those that were crucial to everyday economic endeavors. Many of these figures fall 
under the category of like dying god which is a fertility deity displaying death and regeneration elements. But they exhibit diverse characteristics depending on whether they are fertility deities revered by people who live in marshes, orchards, forests or villages. This is true of the stage which may have existed as early as the 4th millennium BCE. A second stage was characterized by a perception of the gods as having a human form and being arranged in a social structure that was traditionally democratic with each deity having distinct roles and responsibilities. This is true of the stage throughout the 3rd millennium BCE that protected the religious forms and threats of previous stages also. After this, the third stage evolved during the 2nd and 1st millennium BCE. It was characterized by a developing emphasis on personal religion involving concepts of sin and forgiveness. All this undoubtedly changes the earlier perception of democratic divine polity into an absolute faith and belief on the divine intervention. The existing knowledge about the ancient Mesopotamian religion rests exclusively on archaeological sources recovered from the ruined city mounds of Mesopotamia during the 19th and the 20th century. Of greatest significance is the literary evidence also, which includes, for example, texts which were written in cuneiform script on tablets made of clay or for monumental purposes on stone also. There is no doubt that the main sources or specifically religious texts comprising God lists, myths, hymns, laments, prayers, rituals, omen texts, incantations and other forms. Common religious beliefs were also communicated in letters and administrative documents. Now we'll be talking about Mesopotamian worldview as is expressed in some myths. The origins of the human species were described in the myths which are stories about the acts of the gods. Moreover, these myths assisted individuals in making sense of their surroundings which provided answers to questions concerning origins and existences. The myths typically explain the gods, their actions and the origins of the world. Creation was thus an important theme in mythology and was explained by separation of the primeval matter that is water, solid or a mixture of two. According to Enuma Elish, which is the Akkadian epic of creation, there was nothing in the beginning except primordial Apsu, which is a male, the sweet waters, the Taimat, which is a female and the waters of the ocean. The origin of the universe was traced to their union. For the Sumerians, creation began when Enlil, which was their chief god, was separated, a single body of matter, into a two-level universe in order to prepare the world for mankind. In general, people of ancient Mesopotamia rarely questioned how the primordial elements came into being. In this context, a Sumero-Babylonian incantation explains it as a concept of spontaneous generation from water. In Mesopotamian stories, creation always resulted in heaven and earth, as the people believed that both existed. Moreover, there are two fundamental explanations about the beginning of the humans in creation stories. In one version, the human race sprouted from the ground like plants and herbs, while in the other, mankind was created from clay mixed with divine blood and modeled into figurines. In ancient Mesopotamia, divine blood sometimes combined with divine spittle, which was necessary to infuse the clay with life. Man was created to take over the gods' work so that the gods could rest. When the world became overpopulated, the gods brought a flood. A trespass against the gods was often the main topic in Sumerian sources about religion and there are many words for the sins also. All this shows that people regarded personal well-being 
as being tied to right worship of the gods. It was often believed that if an individual sinned or community neglected the proper rites, disorder, plague, earthquake, fire or other catastrophes could befall the entire community. The religion of the priest was focused on the image of God and the temple. The priest was concerned with the religious service sacrifices and hymns of praise. It is evident that royal religion differed from that of the priest and the ordinary citizen. The king alone undertook prayers, fasts, mortification and taboos. However, the religion of the common people still remains largely a mystery. For the average person, religion was ceremonial and formal rather than intense and private. Every Babylonian had a personal god to whom he gave continuous offerings. Also, the personal god mediated with the higher gods on the worshippers' behalf. Thus, it is evident that the Babylonian relationship between the worshipper and the personal gods can best be explained as benefits for the worshipper in return for the offerings he made. If the process did not succeed, the supplicant threatened to abandon his god and seek another. Now, moving to another aspect of religion in ancient, ancient Mesopotamia, we'll be now talking about the development of the pantheon in ancient Mesopotamia. The Mesopotamians regarded the supernatural forces that control their world as mysterious and impersonal. Such forces were essentially called numina. People mostly believed that storms, rivers, lakes, marshes, mountains, sun, wind and fire were all living beings. The religious beliefs of the Sumerians took form in Eredo, one of the oldest Sumerian settlements. For them, Water was a numerous power, a supernatural life force. During the 4th millennium BC, Mesopotamians worship forces of nature, that is, the power of fertility. For example, spring was brief and its fertile powers declined as the dry hot summer came. Myths explained the vacillation of fertility and sterility. The progressive humanization of supernatural forces resulted from the human need for a meaningful relationship with them. Ultimately, this led to a growing preference for the human form or older non-human forms, which were known as nomina, and a preference for organizing the gods according to human patterns of family and profession. The 3rd millennium BCE assured a period of war. Kingship began as a provisional office during times of danger. When the crisis passed, the king no longer held power. Once war became prolonged, the office of the king became a permanent position. He had both an army for security and a labor to maintain the city wall. A new literary form developed in the form of an epic tale which took its place next to the myth. In the epic, man was represented by the hero king, who symbolized society's will in peace and war. The king had to identify the gods' will and properly carried out their orders to shield the society from divine wrath or neglect. There were standing commands, such as cultic activities and maintenance of the temple. Sometimes, the king received definite instructions from the gods in dreams or romances. The ruler metaphor was extended to the gods. Nature gods were converted into city gods or heads of the state. In their roles as kings, the gods were expected to protect their territories against outsiders. In addition to their cosmic roles, the gods were given authority by powerful deities. In national cults, the great gods of the Sumerian pantheon were equated with similar semantic gods. The polytheistic view of ancient people allowed them to accept the gods of other nations as well. The rank of the gods replicated the political relationship between nations. In their political role, 
the gods and goddesses organized a primitive democracy which met at Nippur in an assembly presided over by N and N Lil. It was at Nippur political decisions such as wars were discussed and humanity's crimes were judged. The gods were regarded as an aristocracy of great landowners, that is the country's commanding upper class. In many Sumerian and Akkadian stories, hymns, prayers, historical records and royal inscriptions, the gods assumed that man was created to serve them. This pantheon includes various administrators and divine artisans. In this way, man's world was revealed in the heavenly world of the gods. The gods had wives, mostly secondary figures, children, courtiers and servants akin to a human ruler, but without human boundaries. And the relationship between different city gods were defined through family ties. Now let's talk about the composition of the pantheon. The gods were named in a canonical list around 3rd millennium BC, which enclosed almost 2,000 entries. Most of the enumerated gods had Sumerian names. However, the gods developed semantic threats as a result of political events. In the Neo-Sumerian period, the number of gods also increased. In addition to the principal god of the Sumerians, Enlil, Sumerians themselves estimated that they have 3600 gods. The gods list outlined the main structure of the pantheon. Anu, which was the sky god, originally was the chief god of the pantheon. Later some of his attributes were assigned to Enlil and to Marduk in Babylonia and Ashur in Assyria. There were around 30 great gods at the time of the decline of the Mesopotamian Empire. A chief god in a local pantheon was envisioned as surrounded by members of his family, ministers and even servants. There was patron deity for each and every profession and activity such as a god of brick making and a god of brewing. Also, Many local pantheons developed in different areas. From the 3rd millennium BC onwards, an Akkadian Anu was head of the pantheon. His name meant sky and thus was considered as the god of sky. It is believed that all things on heaven and earth conformed to his will because his command was the foundation of heaven and earth. Also, as the ultimate source of all authority, An was associated with the highest authority on earth, the king, whom he designated as ruler. According to the official pantheon, the great god list known as An Anum, An's female consort was Antum, a female derivative of An. From her breasts, the clouds brought forth her milk, which was the rain. Kai, which means earth, was sometimes labeled as his consort as well. He impregnated her with his sperm, the rain, and then she gave birth to trees, reeds, and all other vegetation. Enlil, which was the lord of wind, played an important role in human affairs. Initially as the national god of the Sumer, Enlil originally handled the tablets of destiny on which destinies of men and gods were decreed. His role later on was assumed by the Marduk. Enlil also was the moist wind of spring and the creator of the Hu, the farmer's most important tool in his agriculture. Enlil displayed both qualities as the benign wind of spring and also as the destructive storm. Ninkur Saga was ranked third and her name means Lady of the Stony Ground or Lady of the Foothills. She was the goddess of birth for pregnant animals, providing shelter for them in the hut, fold or pen. Also, she acted as a midwife to the gods. Enki belongs to Akkadian A, 
was the god of fresh waters and a supporter to mankind. He was the cradle of all sacred magical knowledge. He was known for his cleverness and uses his brain against other gods during the times of war. Nana, which was the Akkadian sin, was considered as the full moon, the crescents and the new moon. At any rate, Nana was essentially connected with the cattle herds that were the livelihood of the people in the marshes of the Lower Euphrates River, where the cult basically developed in the city of Ur, which was the main center. Then Uto, Akkadian Shah Marsh, whose Sumerian and Akkadian names mean sun, was assigned with the responsibility of dispensing justice to both gores and men. As a solar deity, Otu exercised the power of light over darkness and evil. Otu was placed to protect the boundaries for heaven and earth. Then Inanna, Akkadian Ishtar, was the sister of Otu, which embodied the roles of different goddesses and was called Lady of Myriad Offices. It is important to document that in Mesopotamian theology, gods never aged or died of natural causes, rather through a violent death. For instance, younger gods killing older gods in a struggle for succession or office, defeating rebel gods being punished by death or in monster slaying. Tammuz, Akkadian Tammuzi, was the god of fertility embodying the powers for the new life on nature in the supreme. As shown in his most common epithet, Sipar, Tammuz was essentially a pastoral deity. It is also believed that this god has the power for everything that a shepherd wished for, including grass to come up in the desert, healthy lambs to be born, and milk to be plentiful in the mother animals. Now, talking about the service to the gods, the ancient Mesopotamians believed that man was created to serve the gods and goddesses. This principle was interpreted literally, so the image of the god was cared for, fed, and clothed. The temple administration included the chief priest, various kinds of exorcists, singers, musicians, scribes, and the staff who supervised the temple businesses. Also, the temple staff purified the temple frequently. A text from the Seleucid period comments that the divine statues in the temple of Uruk were served two meals daily. The first meal was served in the morning when the temple was opened and the other was served at night immediately after the doors of sanctuary were closed. Each meal included two courses called main and the second. Music was also performed when the meals were served to the gods. It is worthy to mention here that enormous quantities of food were served to the temple administration and craftsmen. For instance, a text listed daily total of more than 500 kilograms of bread, 40 sheep, 2 bulls, 1 block, 8 lambs, 70 birds and ducks, 4 wild boars, 3 ostrich eggs, dates, figs, raisins, and 54 containers of beer and wine in addition to the other offerings. Also, the best agricultural products and animals were sent to the temples. Now we'll be talking about the basis of Mesopotamian civilization, which were found in its religion. Religion occupies the central place of Mesopotamian life as every human activity, whether political, military, social, legal, literally, artistic, was in reality subordinated to an overriding religious purpose. The Mesopotamians believed that the people were given life so that they can fulfill on earth the will of the gods in heaven. No important decision was made by the king or priestess without the consultation of the gods. The cities of Mesopotamia were sacred communities dedicated to serving the divine master and people believed that pleasing the gods would bring prosperity and security to the cities. Thus, 
each day belonged to a particular god who was the real owner of the land and real ruler of the city. The Mesopotamians have firm belief that the gods control the entire universe and everything in it. The gods supervised the city, the irrigation system, the fields, the moon, the sun and the storm. It is pertinent to mention that the life in Mesopotamia was filled with insecurity, danger and uncertainty. Sometimes the volatile waters of the rivers broke through the dikes, flooding fields, running crops and even damaging some cities. While at the other times an insufficient overflow deprived the land of water, causing crops to fail. They lived in a culture of anxiety that pervaded their society as a result of such and numerous other circumstances. Contributing to this sense of insecurity was the belief that the gods behaved impulsively, malevolently and vindictively. The Sumerian religion was a religion for this world exclusively and it offered no hope for a blissful and eternal afterlife. The Sumerians believed that the life after death was a mere temporary existence in a dreary, shadowy place which later came to be called Sheol. The ghosts of the deceased stayed in this place for a while, maybe for a generation or two, and then vanished altogether. It is true that no one could look forward to resurrection in another world and a joyous eternal existence as a recompense for the evils of this life. The victory of the grave was complete. In accordance with these beliefs, the Sumerians bestowed only inadequate care upon the bodies of their dead. The Sumerians practiced no mummification and built no elaborate and monumental tombs at all. Most of the times, corpses were commonly interred beneath the floor of the house without a coffin and with comparatively only few articles for the use of the ghost. There was little spiritual content in Sumerian religion. As we have seen, the gods were not spiritual beings, but creatures cast in the human mold, with most of the weaknesses and passions of mortals. Nor were the devotions of the religion any more spiritual, and it did not provide any blessings in the form of solace, uplift of the soul or oneness with God. If it benefited humanity at all, it did so chiefly in the form of worldly gain of abundant harvests and prosperity in business. Also, the religion did not had some ethical content. All the major deities in the Sumerian pantheon were no doubt extolled in hymns as lovers of truth, goodness and justice. So students, this is all what we have to study under the title Religion of Ancient Mesopotamia. I hope you have enjoyed the lecture. Thank you so much.